have it in front of you. Um, since some of you don't have it in front of you, I assume that they're the ones who know it by heart, so that's all right. Um, um, t tonight we will actually look quite closely at um, the first 11 verses. Um, of course, if we were to take an hour on each 11 verses in Acts, this would be a very, very, very long retreat, so we're not going to do that. But uh, as with many New Testament books, the introduction is really very, very important, and uh, important as, as giving a sense of pattern and shape and introducing what the main themes are going to be. And so we're going to look at that together. And uh, I, I wanted to talk about heaven and earth particularly, and that's why we sang, I guess, some of the things that we just did. Uh, I did some talks on Acts a year or so ago for a group in my diocese, and I called it the Heaven on Earth Show. Um, it, it, is, it is really about, the whole book is really about what it looks like when the life of heaven comes to birth on earth. Most of us, I think, if put on the spot, if you, you ask somebody in your church, what, it, what would it look like if, if heaven came to earth? We would have images of bliss and glory and delight and so on. And we fail to realize that the mission of the church, the fact of the church, is grounded in the belief that heaven and earth have actually come together in several highly significant senses. Yes, of course, we await the time of the final consummation when they will come together in a new way again. But we sell ourselves short when we imagine that the two have not already come together. And that's what tonight in particular is going to be about. So let's just look at, to begin with, at the, the, the beginning, the first, the first five verses of the Acts of the Apostles and see the way in which Luke sketches um, so many of the themes that are going to be coming through. To begin with, this is, of course, all about Jesus. It's easy to forget when you're doing Acts that it is all about Jesus. Of course, from one point of view, Jesus has done all that he is going to do on the earth in the course of his earthly ministry, his announcement of the kingdom, his dying, and his rising. And we're just about to get his ascension. But Luke makes it quite clear that the first book, the gospel, was written about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning, or in an equally good translation, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And I'm sure many of you know this. In fact, I'm sure many of the things I'm going to say are stuff that you've seen in commentaries and preached about yourselves. But Luke was telling in the first book the story of how Jesus began to do those things. And part of the point of Acts is that this is Jesus himself, through his spirit, working in and through the church to establish his kingdom in the world, his kingdom on earth as in heaven. And when then after his resurrection, verses uh, 2 and 3, after his resurrection he appeared to them over the course of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. I remember once in Oxford when I was a graduate student saying uh, to, uh, whether it was our fellowship group, I'm not sure, in the church that Maggie and I then attended, can somebody please tell me in one sentence what this phrase kingdom of God actually means. I was then just starting work on St. Paul. Paul doesn't often use the phrase kingdom of God. That was not a buzz thing there. But I had become more and more puzzled because what I was hearing in sermons and reading in books about the kingdom of God as that phrase is used in the Gospels didn't actually, there's always one. I knew, I knew this evening that was going to happen. Um, but uh, there we are. Um, happily it isn't mine, which it might have been. Um, th th this phrase kingdom of God so is has been so misunderstood uh, in the Western tradition in particular. And there's a whole study waiting to be done by somebody who knows the church history better than I do on the way in which the phrase kingdom of God and other phrases like it declined away from what it means in the New Testament and actually got translated into something else entirely because for so many people, and I suspect many of your uh, good folk in your churches, unless you've been banging it into them very hard, 
will just go back to default mode where kingdom of God means heaven and where heaven is a long way away ontologically from us and where it is a long way away, we hope, temporarily from us because heaven is the place where God's people go when they die. And so kingdom of God becomes for so many people uh, a place, a kingdom, and it is the place which we call heaven and it's the place we hope to go to one day. And the whole point of the Gospels and Acts is that it is not so. That the kingdom of God is God's sovereign, saving rule coming on earth as in heaven. If you've read my book, Surprised by Hope, you'll know that there and in other places, I've tried basically to turn our Western tradition inside out in line, I hope, with Scripture itself and to point out what we, we in the West have forgotten but should never have forgotten, that the whole point of Jesus' ministry and mission was to inaugurate what he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as in heaven. In fact, I suspect this is a kind of preliminary riff to an awful lot of what I'm going to say, but, but let's just get it in our heads before we, before we really get underway. I suspect that really ever since the Middle Ages, Western Christianity has tended to assume that the gospel is about how to go to heaven and that the gospels, plural, are books about the stuff that Jesus did in order to set us a good example, in order to teach us some important truths and in order then to do the climactic thing of dying and rising so that we could then one day go to heaven. And actually, for many people's theology, both Catholic and Protestant, both Anglican and Baptist and Presbyterian and everybody else, it really wouldn't much have mattered as long as Jesus had been born of a virgin, died on a cross and rose three days later. Wouldn't much have mattered if he hadn't done all that other stuff in between. And then you wonder, why did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John bother to tell us all that stuff in between? And so often I find now in my tradition that we have two different sorts of Christians in the Anglican world. Well, 110 different sorts of Christians in the Anglican world. But um, two in particular, Epistles Christians and Gospels Christians. Epistles Christians who think that Christianity is all about getting saved, and you get that out of Paul. And then Gospels Christians who think that it's actually all about bringing God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. But then they're not quite sure why Jesus had to die and rise, because he started doing that stuff and we copy him and we do that stuff, um, and isn't that what it's all about? And I spend quite a bit of my professional life trying to enable those two sorts of Christians to learn from and listen to one another. And I suspect that that's part, actually, of the agenda that we have to engage with in the Western church right now. Again, both Catholic and Protestant, liberal and conservative, um, we need to bring the picture back together again. And that is what Acts is all about. 